Good evening, everyone. Good morning to some. Good afternoon to others. Welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. I am your host, Jason Miles. Thank you oh so much for joining us. If you are new to the show, please hit the like and subscribe button and please hit the bell as we're constantly adding new programming to the channel. I mean, hell, I got new shows that the guys on the panel today don't even know about that are about to drop next week. So do those things. Thank you guys for your patience as well as we were having a very interesting off-air conversation as we normally do. So let me bring in my homie, my dog, my co-host. He is the man of the Mau Mau Hour. He is the Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles, my brother, comrade, friend, my man. <laughs> People said I'm being more pixelated. I can stop all the pixelation. I'm just starting to like being all messed up in your view. I love it. Um, do I look all pixelated to you, Pascal? No, just a little blurry, not pixelated. Okay. Well, that's fine. Um, I do want to add for all the patrons and new patrons, Pascal and I have finally decided on a movie for movie night. Word is born. Word is born. And we are excited to uh, to do the movie and then, of course, have the conversation like we did last time. That was actually so much fun. Seeing a lot of your guys' faces for the first time, that was hella fun. Can we share what the movie night movie is? Or you don't want to Heck share? yeah. The movie night movie, for all of our fans who may not know or those who may know, is the classic, I believe, 1982 film, Denzel Washington, Soldier's Story. I told you. Oh. Many of you may not be familiar with that film. A brief little vignette of Pascal Robert. One of the first dramatic presentations I saw in theater as a youth was at the United Negro Ensemble, which was a black theater in New York, which is very famous. Many black act actors come out of the United ne uh, Negro Ensemble. As a youth, the first one of the first plays I'd ever seen, and definitely the first play I saw at the United Negro Ensemble, was A Soldier's Play, which is the dramatic rendition of the movie A Soldier's Story. That's that's also one of those movies my dad made me watch, because uh, you know, I, I I'm not complaining. He just like I complain not complain as Gene was making fun of me, reliving my childhood trauma. My dad, anything he wanted to watch, I had to watch. So. I watched the Soldier Story. If you if you had cable back in the eighties, it came on like every other day, and I really, really, really enjoyed that movie. So when Pascal brought it up, I was like, "Yep, let's do it." That is a great, great film, and maybe just maybe we'll bring in uh, Toure Reed to uh, to watch it with us. And, Corey uh, loves that movie. He to loves that movie. as well. But that is a movie that Cuba is not in his black cinema list. That's on a different list. Well, you know what's funny about we talked about what's funny about that movie, right? There's something Remember? funny about it? No, there's something David funny. Greer? Well, well, well man, can, can you indulge me? Sure. Remember we how we got to talking about Soldier Story? We were talking about a clip of Denzel Washington talking about yes. racial authenticity and film. And he was talking about, he was like, you say, you say, you say. You know, many people could have done Shingler's last, but, 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 you know, uh, who was, who did Shingler's list? Was it, uh, 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 Spielberg did it because it's called Spielberg. Spielberg did Shingler's list. It was like, you know, it was not about, it was, what he said, it was not about, uh, the story. It was about the culture. He's like, because he understood the culture. So Denzel Washington in this video, I'm sure you guys have seen this video. Denzel is making this argument, right? That we need to have, Black directors tell our stories because we are specifically in tune with our culture. And he's trying to justify the film that he's in. I believe it was uh, most the of the Fences. Fences. Fences, right, which is a film that's written by 
well known black playwright. Right. Uh, right. Oh my God. I can't, I, from what Pittsburgh. Is his name? The guy from Pittsburgh who drove. Isn't it something fences. right? I can't think of his first well, name. We right. are being horrible right now with black I, shit. I cannot believe I forgot the name of no the was Very familiar, well known black playwright, man. August Wilson. Oh, August, it was August Wilson. Wilson. August Who's Wilson. The guy with the last name Wright that wrote plays. Like August Wilson, right? And so Denzel's argument was like, well, you know, you've got to have, you know, it takes us uh, familiar with the culture. And I'm telling Jason's telling me, so I was like, you know what we, what, we know what he's saying is bullshit, right? And he's like, yeah. why is that bullshit? I said, probably one of the best rendition, renditions of black military cinema on film that Denzel Washington starred with, that everyone starred and everyone thinks is a black movie, was directed by Norman Jewison. It's a soldier story. Well, also, I mean, Denzel totally ignores the fact that Color Purple was directed by Spielberg, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I mean, that, that's that's the famous argument based on standpoint epistemology, and for people who, you know, that fancy word is basically saying because I'm of X Y Z identity, I am mm-hmm. the best at knowing the narrative of X Y Z people. I think standpoint epistemology is kind of bullshit, actually. Well, speaking of standpoint epistemology, let's bring in our favorite, <laughs> our favorite Polish person, or is he the only Polish person we know? Well, he's the only Polish person that matters to me. He is Deep State Cuba. Hello, everyone. Um, I am deeply offended that you um Overlooked Pope John Paul II, His Holiness Beatified, Future Saint. Um, now there's a Polish person that should matter to everyone. <laughs> this is the funniest comment tonight. <laughs> Stay on target. <laughs> See? But you Pope know, John Paul like, went to Haiti. I know that he did. The and he visit um, Kazal. Yeah, he did. Because oh, that was a and... poor area. He was actually very loved by the Haitian people, Pope John Paul. The, well, speaking of Pope John Paul and Polish people, Cuba wanted to discuss Poland and what's going on right now because Poland is getting hit with uh, a bunch of refugees. Word. From the Ukraine. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what's going on? So. It's- Since the uh, fighting began, approximately 1 million Ukrainians have fled the country looking for refuge uh, to the West. There's been a smaller flow, maybe about 100,000 people uh, leaving the Donbass region to go east into Russia. And uh, so you have over a million war refugees going in all directions. Uh, Poland has received the largest influx, probably half of the total. And this is a very sharp reversal of the um, 2015 um, migration flows, which largely came from the Middle East, uh, Africa, and affected Southern Europe and the Balkans primarily, with uh, Germany famously uh, adopting a policy of accepting large numbers and the EU attempting to create a mechanism to distribute them uh, across the continent so no single country would be overwhelmed. And it was also a way to try to dilute the number that were coming into countries like Sweden, um, Germany itself, which had, which were widely seen as being the most receptive to asylum seekers and the most generous in the types of benefits that they would provide. So the EU tried to move some of the asylum seekers in the Eastern Europe, which wasn't a destination of choice for the asylum seekers for many reasons, poor nationalistic country, um, fair amount of uh, ethnic prejudice, and the governments too, fiercely resistant, fiercely resistant to uh, allowing any resettlement of that wave of migration. Now, the migrants are not coming from the south, but they're coming from the east. And they are Slavic people. They, uh, Ukraine and Poland have a very close and lengthy history together, one which hasn't always been a happy one. But nevertheless, there is a, 
uh, acknowledgement, uh, recognition of some shared experience, some connection, some kinship, uh, sometimes literal kinship, because um, there's intermarriage between Poles and Ukrainians is not particularly uncommon. And many Polish people have families that at one point lived in Ukraine um, before settling, coming back into central Poland. My own family uh, on my father's side lived in Lviv for uh, uh, generations before moving into Kraków before World War II. So um, Poland has been very receptive to the Ukrainian uh, refugee flows, uh, accepting people, uh, no questions asked, to come in with a very robust civil society network and uh, public sponsorship to help them um, settle, to find family members to get them established in Poland so that they could hopefully wait out the war and return, um, return to their homes quickly. The one issue that has come up, and this is especially pointed given the obvious differential welcome received by uh, Southerners, um, Africans, um, Middle Easterners, Muslims, Arabs, Afghans, uh, Syrians, that were many of whom were also fleeing devastating conflicts in their homelands. Um, the it's clear that there is an ethno-cultural dimension and a racial dimension to that differential treatment. And it's impacted um, foreign students and other third country nationals coming from the Middle East, India, Africa, that are also fleeing for their lives from the Russian advance, but are receiving a decidedly cold shoulder um, at the border. The pretext being that since they aren't members of the Schengen uh, zone, they don't um, have Ukrainian passports, then the emergency measures, accepting the Ukrainians don't cover them, and they need visas to enter. Of course, this isn't true. There are protocols in place for um, people in the um, in, in the uh, fleeing war zones that exempt them from visa restrictions. But the Polish mentality shaped by its response in 2015 has been to treat anyone of darker complexion as a potential migrant, as someone who, whatever the circumstances that brought them to the Polish border is really just an illegal immigrant waiting for their way in. This isn't, of course, a universal attitude in Poland. I wouldn't even say that it's necessarily a commonplace one or a majoritarian one. But remember, the same border guards that are admitting the Ukrainians and uh, processing the third country nationals have been trained to precisely do just that, exclude anyone from a uh, non-European country, non-Western country, without um, papers, without docu without the appropriate visas, because of those um, asylum seeker fears. So they've been primed and selected, right, for their willingness to have that harsh um, exclusionary attitude towards um, certain kinds of uh, people seeking entry, certain kinds of refugees. It's very upsetting, especially since these are just human beings fleeing war, most of whom just want to go home. But there are no flights to Lagos anymore from Kiev they can take. If they could, they would. And those that policy and those... Um, that practice rather and that attitude is, is getting in the way of um, the refuge and the safety and the return that um, every every person fleeing conflict uh, deserves hungary 
has also has just explicitly said this. Orban has said this directly. You know, Ukrainians are valuable people. We accept refugees, but migrants, no, thank you. Cool. I want. I mean, I really, you know, I, I want to give you uh, some credit here for uh, being candid about the uh, racial and ethnic hostility that basically largely black and brown people are facing in your ancestral homeland uh, as a consequence of this uh, tragedy in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll, I'll be very honest with you is that I, I know from Polish history, and I know this generally, is I don't believe in essentialized notions of people are racist. You know what I'm saying? I have growing up as in an area of white ethnics in New York City, yes, I dealt with a lot of racism from, you know, Italians, Irish, and other white ethnics, but one of the most inspirational teachers I had in college in terms of changing and radicalizing my worldview was an Italian professor who was very well known on the left. Her name is Silvia Federici, and uh, uh, she had a profound influence on my life. So if I assumed these kind of generalizations of people from various white or European ethnicities just being essentially racist, I would have never been open enough to accept her uh, tutelage and influence that she had on me. But at the same time, the question I want to ask you is that um, for me, as someone who has family who's lived in Russia, who has family who's engaged with Slavic people, um, one of the things that I, I've, I've been told is that one of the tragic consequences of the collapse of socialism in uh, Eastern Europe is that the sense of racial and ethnic solidarity, as bad as things it may have been when the Soviet Union was there, that existed amongst the socialized Slavic people because of the ensuing economic crises that became normative after the fall of the Soviet, the Soviet Union evaporated and many of them, unfortunately, pivoted to a very racist, racist type of demeanor. Do you think there's truth to that? And do you think that that, that pivot is, is an actual true telling of, of, of events? No, I think it's overblown. The uh, socialist internationalism and universal um, proletarian brotherhood was a concept that did motivate people in the early stages of the Soviet Union um, during the, especially, especially the socialist movements before World War I and through the 1920s. Um, and it, it's been kept alive in many leftist um, environments, uh, milieus um, outside of the Eastern Bloc. But because of the extraordinary level of repression that different Eastern Bloc countries faced at different times. In Poland, it basically starts immediately because Poles were seen quite racistly as an unreliable people, all, all of them. Uh, the Jews, maybe, but the Gentiles, forget about it. You know, they are all reactionary. Uh, that's why uh, Stalin colluded with Hitler um, in the plans to exterminate the Polish intelligentsia, exterminate the Polish officer corps, exterminate any leadership class among Polish Gentiles, uh, including the Polish indigenous communist party. Um, the Czechoslovakians got theirs in 1968. The Hungarians were always pretty racist and always a little fascist, um, and have only gotten more so. So the, um, idea of socialist internationalism was one which officially was a creed, just like uh, equality of the sexes. But as soon as people lost trust in any pronouncements made by that officialdom, it was treated as an entirely uh, cynical, um, you know, bullshit commitment just designed to validate and legitimize um, Soviet domination. And it actually made people pivot back to um, ethnic uh, notions even harder because the domination of the Soviets was often read as Russian domination, as an extension of ancestral and pre-Soviet um, 
contests based on national identity or, or religion. When the communist bloc falls, um, what you see is not the diminishing of socialist solidarity and internationalism, but the casting off of this obligatory, ritualized and empty language um, and a reversion to one of two tendencies, which are basically the only real alternatives in uh, post-Soviet uh, Eastern Europe. And that is a kind of civic 19th century liberalism and straight up ethno-nationalism. So I, I think that the Soviet, um, the Soviet model and international uh, leftism was very inspirational for a very small number of Eastern Bloc residents, but um, ultimately it did not leave a mark, except in that when the Soviets discredited the appeal of leftism by its association with uh, repression, um, socialist internationalism went with it. Well, uh, that's an interesting narrative. I kind of reject all of it, but I mean, it, it's still interesting. Not all of it, but a lot of it in that I no, do please think tell me that, what polls think. Well, I mean, I'm not talking about the, the I can't, I can't, I can't argue with you about the position of poll, mm -hmm. polling on it. I have no credibility in that area at all, but I do think the difference between, you know, being 200 years behind the rest of industrial Europe as a peasant feudal country and being modernized to the point where you're part of a nation that is the second most powerful country in the world, you know, that's not something that you can just say is insignificant. So I understand that there definitely comes a cost to that. But the fact that, you know, I always say, well, what exactly was life in the uh, Russian Empire like before the Soviet Union, when everyone was, a, you know, a feudal peasant? I don't exactly think people want to go back to them as well. You all do have electricity now, don't you? But again, I, I understand we don't need to pick and choose here. But my position is that the, the transition from the Russian Empire to the Soviet Union being quote unquote valueless, I think is, I would say more than a dubious position in that. I, I'm sorry, I, I, I missed what, the word. Oh, the I would say to say valueless, to say that that transition was valueless. Oh, I, I didn't say it was valueless. Well, I'll, all right. Well, then I may mean, I mean, I miscarry. I just I uh, am less dismissive of that, but I do understand that there's a particular sensitivity that is justifiable that you, as uh, someone who was Polish, who has whose family was persecuted by the uh, uh, the, the Soviet state. Both grandfathers um, were repressed. Uh, one was a genuine. Uh, counter-revolutionary, but the other one was a genuine communist. You know, uh, and and I can understand, I can understand that they're definitely breeding a certain level of hostility. Uh, my experience uh, from the uh, other side of me, the world. Let, let me just say something once, and um, and then then I'll I'll, I'll uh, I won't have to repeat it. Uh, my attitude towards the Soviet Union is um, deeply conflicted and ambivalent because on the one, I, I don't, I never said valueless. I see certain advances that the Soviet Union achieved and um, they are remarkable. Um, they, some of them are absolutely extraordinary and inspiring. Sputnik, for instance, that's, that's a world historical achievement. That's, that was um, part of the ascent of mankind made possible only through the Soviet Union. Yuri Gagarin is a global, human hero but that those dizzying heights go together with uh, the deepest pits and the most atrocious crimes so depending on the question that you ask me you're going to get one extreme or the other there's really no middle ground and i don't know how to balance them well I, I, again i actually appreciate I, that candor as well i think that's fair and i, and I think uh you know, one thing we talk about on this show is the contradictions that lie in history, right? There is no absolutes. Can we all agree on that? Uh, death is an absolute. Wow. You don't even want to agree? You just want to be difficult? 
You don't even have a purple shirt on. But that's true, though. Are you just going to be difficult with this fucking tan-ass shirt? You don't like the purple shirt? You don't like the tan <laughs> shirt? You like the white shirt? <laughs> the white shirt is the best shirt, and the suit? I don't know. A nice brown shirt, right? Like, there's something it, to be no, said. Like, good like creases. Plus, if you've got just, like, a little, like a little color accent on your brown someone shirt. Told, someone told me that this shirt actually literally looks like a Mau Mau uniform shirt. And I I like the white button-up. The classic white button-up. Um, okay. I am a fan of the suit in all of its iterations. In different tie combinations. You know, my brother tried to argue with me. He's like, yo, you should wear a tie on the show every day. I was like, what? Pascal, I was like, you know how many farts that's I got to hold in when I got that tie on? That's my job. I'm the tie <laughs> guy. But what I do want to pivot to, Pascal wants to talk about Joe Biden's SCOTUS pick. And Pascal <clears throat> initially wanted to talk about this uh, a week or so ago. And didn't get into it, but we're going to get into it now. And I remember he, I think you called me up actually and was like, I think this woman could possibly be the most progressive uh, Supreme Court pick I've seen in my lifetime and maybe the most progressive we've seen since Thurgood Marshall. Please explain. You're, you're hyping this up so. Uh, well, uh, one of the things, for those of you who have not been following this particular news, because basically we're kind of in a, uh, you know, questioning whether or not we'll be in World War III, and I can understand not paying attention. Joe Biden, uh, when he was running for president in 2020, stated that one of the things that was going to be on his agenda was to make sure that he nominated a Black woman to be on the Supreme Court. Now, for those of us who have been fans of our show, or who have read my writings for years, I am profoundly antagonistic to shallow, vapid, liberal identity politics. Now, I want to make a very important distinction. Just because I'm against shallow, vapid, liberal identity politics does not mean I argue that we should not have gender, racial, ethnic, sexual orientation uh, diversity in the workplace, in corporate spaces, in working places. I, I absolutely believe, number one, that no one should be discriminated from a job or a position because of their race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, so on and so forth, class, you have you have it, right? And I also believe that in a country like the United States with a history of having its professional spheres dominated by white men literally up until the decade I was born, that it makes sense that we should make aggressive steps to diversify positions of power with communities that have traditionally and genders that have been traditionally alienated. I get that. The problem I have is that when those diversity efforts are presented as the ultimate remedy for the material condition of those various communities that have historically been disadvantaged by the function of capitalism, I realize that it is purely an elite project. And I also realize that it's doing nothing but rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. So you just have a multiplicity of colors of people who are on the deck chairs. That being said, Joe Biden, up until about a month ago, was considering a woman who was a South Carolina judge named Michelle Childs, who was being pushed by uh, Clyburn, as well as uh, Lindsey Graham out of South Carolina. The woman was profoundly reactionary. She had very horrible cor corporate, uh, corporate policy adjudication, anti-labor. She had... Uh, a profoundly, profoundly negative uh, and and adversely, adversely anti-progressive judicial record. And I was prepared to really lay it in to Biden for suggesting uh, Michelle Childs as a, a SCOTUS pick. 
surprisingly, to my to my to my ultimate uh, surprise, Biden drops Michelle Childs, and he decides to go with a black woman, as he promised, named Katanji Brown Jackson. Now, one of the first things that I found interesting about Katanji Brown Jackson was that she grew up in Miami. As someone who lives in Miami, though I didn't grow up in Miami, I was like, hold on. We got a Supreme Court justice who's from the 305? Who is this girl? Uh, I shouldn't call her a girl. That's terrible. That's sexist, this woman. Um, And I find out where she went to high school, and I find out who her parents are, and I was like, okay, she really comes from, like, you know, middle class Miami. Now, to be transparent, right, middle class Miami isn't like the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air middle class. Middle class Miami means your parents went to an HBCU and they had good government jobs. That's what middle class in Miami means. It doesn't mean that like your your dad was CEO of his own construction company and your mom owned her own medical clinic. Middle class in Miami coming out of the 60s and 70s means mom and dad went to college, they may have graduate degrees, and they may work in either education or they may work in some form of government administrative position. And that is what a large segment of what the black middle class in South Florida, unfortunately, was relegated to, largely because of the massive influx of uh, Cuban immigrants who displaced them as beneficiaries to the civil rights movement. That's another conversation. But uh, reading her background, I was like, okay, interesting, whatever. Then I went to her Jewish prudence. And there's two things that actually struck me as moderately impressive. First of all, this woman spent two years at the height of her legal career as a federal criminal defense attorney. What does that mean? That means in terms of federal crime, we're talking a hard federal time, drugs, RICO, uh, uh, white collar crimes, serious federal offenses, she was defending cats who were catching charges. Now, for those of you who are unaware with the traditional qualifications of Supreme Court justices, just to give you a heads up, the last time we had a Supreme Court justice nominee who had any experience as a criminal defense attorney was literally Thurgood Marshall. Sotomayor was a prosecutor. Most of them have been prosecutors if they worked in the criminal legal jurisprudential area. Almost all of them come out of corporate law, but to have a woman who has done two years as a federal criminal defense attorney is not insignificant. Next, this woman was, uh, Katanji Brown Jackson, was federally appointed by Obama to the Federal Sentencing Council, which was a consortium of legal experts whose job it was to create policy and legal structures to mitigate racial and economic disparities in federal criminal criminal sentencing. Let me say that again. This woman was put on a federal committee to work on proposing ways to cut down mandatory minimum criminal sentences and to mitigate the disparities in Uh, punishment for crimes. Give you all a perfect example for those of you who don't know this. The statistical disparity between a black male and a white male convicted of the same crime that carries a potential for um, uh, capital punishment, meaning execution, A black male who commits the same crime as a white male with the same criminal history as a white male has four times more likelihood 
of being sentenced to capital punishment than a white male for the same crime with the same criminal history. These are facts. These are the ways in which disparities affect criminal prosecution in American society. And the, this woman, uh, Katanji Brown Jackson, her job was to advocate policy to actually try to mitigate these type of disparities. Now, there is a debate about why exactly the uh, federal, the, excuse me, the, uh, the Fraternal Order of Police endorsed uh, Katanji Brown Jackson. I hope I'm pronouncing her name wrong. I could be, it's Katan, Kat, Katanji. Why did the Fraternal Order of Police endorse Katanji Brown Jackson? And I did some research on that. And what I found interesting is that in the statement of the uh, the president or the particular the, the head of the Fraternal Order of Police, we, we states why he's supporting her. Apparently, she had police officers in her family. She has a brother who is a detective, and she has uncles who are police officers. And in the statement of the Fraternal Order of Police leader, he states that even though that she has a long history of working to minimize mandatory minimum sentencing, and work in the spirit of diminishing punishment for criminal acts, the fact that she has familial experience with police in her family, and the fact that she was doing that in the spirit of the anti-carceral politics. Anti-carceral means anti-mass incarceration. From to give you context, in the early millennial, from I would say 2000, from the rise of, I would say, from 2000 up until COVID, America was experiencing a politics of anti-carcerality. What does that mean? That's a fancy word of saying that there was a lot of political mobilization against mass incarceration. And people, there were a lot of people, even Trump signed a bill, you know, uh, to, to, to help prisoners get released. Uh, you know, there was a lot of political mobilizing, political efforts. You had the rise of books like The New Jim Crow, regardless of what we think about it. You also have a very good book called Punishing the Poor by Louis Quacant. There is a whole atmospheric politically about fighting the innocent project, about fighting mass incarceration. And uh, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson represents actual political and jurisprudential work in the furtherance of that politics. And what the uh, head of the, federal, uh, the uh, Fraternal Order of Police is saying is that what she was doing was in the best spirit of the politics of the era. Uh, and as a result, he has no problem and he supports her being uh, being able to actually come in and actually uh, propose. Well, so Pascal, I, I wanted to, so I just got a message from, from someone. I, 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 you know who. Um, we talk about them off air. Uh, they sent me a message and it says, uh, send me a case, Ross versus Lockheed Martin. That Katanji Brown uh, was was the judge on uh, the case. Uh, Brown Jackson decided against 5,500 black workers who filed a discrimin discrimination yeah. class action against Lockheed Martin, who was engaging in discriminatory performance reviews and promotional policies to the de detriment of black workers. She refused to certify their class case and blocked a 23 million plus dollar settlement agreement hammered out by attorneys. There was a lot of briefing. Uh, she's actually got the, uh, the the briefs that she's reading. So yeah, I'm glad like, you mentioned um, that. I'm it glad sounds you like that. Brown falls in line with a lot of these Supreme Court picks. And I want to hear what both of you guys have to say about this one. As far as being 
very, very tough on labor. So where they may be a little more laxed on race, they're tougher on, you know, one thing we're trying to get here, we talk about a lot here, which is labor movements and labor politics. So Actually, I, I want to push back against that because she has jurisprudence that's actually very good on labor. And in relation to that case, number one, the judge who wrote the op-ed complaining about that case mm-hmm. was actually a counsel for the plaintiffs. So it's very easy to say why tra- his uh, bias might be more than minimal in terms of why he's angry that her decision stopped him from basically getting any kind of uh, uh, remedy if he's being paid by contingency. Second of all, if you actually read the responses to the case, her determination was not that there was no merit to the case. It's that the way the policy, the settlement was structured would deny other Black victims of the offensive act the capacity to even know how much money they were able to actually obtain for the judgment. So what I'm saying is that her denial of the judgment wasn't based on like, oh, these working Black people don't deserve a remedy, is that there were they were legal nuances to the case that caused her to rule against the plaintiffs in that case that were not rooted in some kind of anti-labor politics. Well, I, I really think you need to have a conversation with this person because they are lawyer tweeting at me right now so hard and you guys need to have a lawyer off and it'll be have to be something we do uh, off air because I'm sure you would get a chocolatey kick out of it. And, uh, and so would she, but she says she decided on the most vague basis and there is no info about how many litigants were left out. So I guess it is a I'll, I'll, I'll see the brief that she that she sent me. I mean, I'd kind of like to see a Pascal lawyer off. Right. I'd I'd be willing to take bets. You know, I'll run. You want to see you want to see a table. lawyer off? This person did uh, immigration law for a long time. Well, and, I, uh, I, I was, I'm not mitigating. I'm not denying that this person. I don't know enough. This person you're talking to clearly has researched the case more extensively than I have. I read a couple of articles and a couple of rebuttals about this accusation of her. So I'm not going to act like I know better than the person you're talking to. I'd like to hear their position and I'd have to look at the case and see what the decision was based on. But again, I'm not willing to necessarily dis disband this woman's whole legal career based on one ruling. I, Hey, I'm with you on all this. I I just think this is at this point now I'm trying to instigate a lawyer off because I do want to see um, you put the suit on. And then we right, have- well, I mean, one of the things I want to say, though, right, is that a lot of all I wish men- that American lawyers still wore the wigs. <laughs> <laughs> it is not Brianna Joy Gray that I'm talking to. So please don't. One start- of the things one of the problems I have, right, is that. Like a lot of our comrades on the black left are going to believe that there should be nothing we can say good about this woman because it's Biden's pick. Biden is evil. Biden is bad. We can't. I'm not telling you to support Biden. I'm not saying this makes Biden a great president. I don't make. I'm not saying that this makes Biden FDR or MLK or do you or 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 or, 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 or a freaking any abbreviation or, LBJ or, or, you know, or Debs GIF or like that. I'm not saying that this doesn't make Biden you know a corporate Degenerates come. I'm not. I'm not trying to praise Biden. I'm just trying to give you objective facts. And what I'm saying that based on the objective facts, there are aspects of this woman's resume that distinguishes her as being more "quote unquote" progressive on significant issues that are of interest to communities of color than the significant majority of Supreme Court justice justice nominees in the last fifty some odd years. I'd like to pick up on on that because I think that you started with um, a position that I absolutely agree with, which is that these types of uh, quota based identity politics are just rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic and that they don't necessarily reflect any uh, representation in a meaningful sense of the interests of the majority of the people that they're nominally supposed to um, sit for. Um, In this case, it sounds like there might actually be some congruence here between um, a new Supreme Court justice, African-American woman, and the the community that in the liberal sort of woke 
identitarian mind she's supposed to speak for and, and validate. Uh, is this actually going to set a kind of troubling precedent where it will, by doing this now, it will seem to make it um, make, give a reality to what is a sort of vapid tokenism? Well, I mean, you know, that's a very good question, Kuma. I'll be very frank with you. I think that, I think it is an injustice. I, it's, I mean, you know, I want to get killed by the black left for saying this. I think it's an injustice to Judge Katanji Brown Jackson that she has been relegated to an identity politics pick because, quite frankly, she's more qualified than a large number of the recent white judges that we've had on the bench. Number one, Amy Kuma graduated magna cum laude from Harvard College. She also graduated cum laude from Harvard Law School. She had three federal clerkships. She clerked at the circuit court level. She clerked at the court of appeals level. She clerked at the Supreme Court level. If you know anyone who went to law school, even an elite law school, ask them how hard it is to get a federal court clerkship, even at the district district court level, no less the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court. And one of the things, and I told Jason, I said, no, I think I saw Torre. I said, man, Torre is going to have me actually crapping on Tucker Carlson to defend a Biden Supreme Court pick. He said, what? You? I said, I can't believe this is happening. He said, why? I said, I said yo, but you hear what, what Tucker Carlson said? Tucker Carlson on his show last night or the night before said about Judge Katanji Brown Jackson, well, I don't know why by everyone thinks that she's so brilliant. I mean, unless we see her LSAT scores, which is going to be the only way we are aware and we find out that she's really, really the next, you know, I don't know, you know, Huey Long, Oliver Wendell Holmes or so on and so forth. I said, hold on, hold on. I said, I said, what did this pecker would say? Her <laughs> L S A T scores? I said, yo, my dude, Amy Conan Barrett went to one of the most mediocre law schools for a, a Supreme Court judge that you can imagine. I could have crapped on my application and got into Notre Dame Law School. Oh. And this woman is on the Supreme Court. And you have the nerve to question whether a woman who clearly was more qualified than any Corn and Barrett. Well, we just lost the yeah, Want to see an outside scores? I was like, yo, this demon is, oh man, this mother freaking demon is bad. No, no more South Indiana patrons. <laughs> no more fighting Irish. I guess we lost on the left. We. <laughs> ah. Oh my God. Uh, as serious as this conversation is, I do have to say the chat making jokes about Cuba growing a five o'clock shadow in an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and then Pascal having a, a barrister wig. It was too much for me to handle. And I exploded in laughter. Why is Notre Dame's law school mediocre? It's not a mediocre law school. That's not fair. It's a good law school. It ain't a law school that Supreme Court judges come from. It, it ain't like an Auburn or a Clemson law school. <laughs> it's more like your LSU, your, your <laughs> the Ohio State. You know, Division One, but not Kansas. <laughs> Says the guy that went to a Division One grad school. The um, honestly did. Did I just like say things accurately because I was just putting together sports words that I remember? Uh, you know that you went and watched Aaron Rodgers and Marshawn Lynch play while you were at Cal, so I don't want to hear shit. Never been to a football game. Yes, you have. You went to a Cal football game because they were giving those tickets away for free, and you saw Marshawn Lynch play, and you helped Deshaun Jackson with his homework. Well, Andy, Andy I, I mean, that sounds like a good party line, and I will not violate it. <laughs> Andy Forrest. Williams, with the fair critique, y'all sound like PMCs, professional managerial class. Yes, this is professional managerial class in fighting nonsense garbage. That's really worthless. Speak before before I, I end with my final words. Uh, 
I do want to ask you guys, I did not watch it, not out of some sort of protest. I've just been extremely uh, busy with show stuff as the show is growing. Um, I am very excited. Maria Repnikova uh, finished her book. It is out for a free download right now. Um, I'll try to find a link and put it up. M. Toussaint is not here to help us out. But uh, she's going to be on the show next Thursday. Did I tell you guys that? Excellent. Um, the Soft Power of China. But I did not watch the State of the Union. Pascal, you why, why would you? Oh, Kuba, did you watch it? Well, of course not. Oh, I, dope. I, None of us watched it. Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> I've got Putin videos to watch. Right? <laughs> nah. um, the, the thing is, and <laughs> let me let me justify, let me explain that statement. When Putin has his like hour long, this is why I'm invading uh, Ukraine speeches, there's actual content there. He m- might be lying or he might be exaggerating or, or fabricating things, but it reflects a recognizable position. Um, and you learn something about his mentality. State of the Union addresses democracy, freedom. There's a firefighter over there. Victims are good, perpetrators are bad. We love guns, but we hate gun violence. And America will always be America. God bless America. Oh, well, thanks. Hey, it's it's a waste of time. Someone called me the Haitian Matlock. I found that funny. <laughs> oh my God, yes, yeah. I I Netflix make that show. <laughs> I, and I just found out through the chat um, that RT America is done. RT America got pulled out, got pulled, bro. This is a Biden decision, or this RT America got pulled? I, yeah, I don't know what Lords of Capital made this happen, but RT they, they pulled RT America, bro. They got shut down. They sent people home. Freaking yeah, this, pink slips this happened, whole night. This happened before with Sinovision too. Um, there was an FBI investigation, and it, it's funny because. Western governments always complain about the censorship that the BBC or American outlets endure overseas. But um, on the, when there's a pretext, they'll happily um, do the same. Yeah, that shit. That's, that's uh, I feel bad about that, man. That's not cool, man. Um, someone says Pascal has to be a one-button suit guy. No, you think I'm a double? Yeah, but as big as I am, you think I'm a double-breasted fool? I Get think Pascal has as he doesn't just button the top. I think Pascal gives you the top and the second button. He leaves the third open. You know. Yeah, but I'm not a double breasted suit cat, man. I, back in the day, I used to have a funky double breasted suit, man. But I'm yeah, too don't wear that shit now, please. It is I'm not too poorly for that shit nowadays. If you wore a double breasted suit, you would look like you just fell out of a guy video. Yeah, nah, man. It's not the look to have right now. Nah, man. But if you want to wear the double breasted suit with the barrister wig. And call yourself the Haitian Netlock. I just realized no more on contact with Chris Hedges. Damn. Yeah. Oh, he'll find somewhere to land. Wait, wait. Is he one of the new shows? (laughs) I'm hoping that's a yes. No, no one from RT is coming on this channel, and not because I hate RT. Hey, that's Putin. It's just my way to to say the terrorists won't win. Uh, a zoot suit. All right, I'm gonna. You guys, you guys, about ready to go to the to the champagne room? I thought you had a spiel that you wanted to make. I have a spiel. I have a rant, an end of show rant, and then and then we can get the fuck out of here. How's that sound? Cursing yeah. is not good for. Oh the my! Algorithm. Yes, you're right. I promise, because you you actually said that, but you guys have been making me laugh, so I apologize for cur. I do this. I sincerely apologize for cursing. I'm very you excited. Think the peckerwood is going to get us demonetized. What peckerwood? I said peckerwood. Is it going to get us demonetized? Yeah, peckerwood, dude. People are hella mad Only about. Only if racial. it's a peckerwood making that decision. Only if a peckerwood programmed the algorithm. <laughs> 
Cracker hard R. One more time. Hard R. On the one. <laughs> <laughs> I am noticing <clears throat> a popular trend among people on the left to have discussions about the utility of electoral politics. It seems to just be about federal and not about local <sighs> politics. Has that become something a bit too niche for those of us that make their living talking to a wide range of people via the Internet? localized focus doesn't really crack the algorithm like a good rant on the perceived ineffectiveness of Congress people that have a larger internet platform than us. U.S. federal elections are not just a domestic discussion. Uh, there are many on the online left in other countries as well that make a living pontificating on what's going on in the states. The arguments at some point become stale and stuck in simply presidential elections or the two-party duopoly, a redundant discussion of frivolity. A big reason I see for this rehash talk is the fact that A, we're in a midterm election cycle, and B, a lot of us here on the left got hyper-politicized by Trump and the excitement of Bernie in the 2016 election cycle. Socialism became a rebellious moniker, and as Catherine Lou said so eloquently on our show, podcasters are the new rock stars but are these stars captured by capitalist realism we exist in a hyper politicized moment where a burgeoning left is still trying to figure out how to view the world through a left lens all while trying to awaken from a generational american exceptionalism coma in the framework of independent media, we must strive to be more than simply reactionary messaging following mainstream media talking points. There are no rules here, right? We can cover whatever we want to cover, and yet so many self-proclaimed left voices fall victim to the echo chamber of mindlessly regurgitating the exact thing they claim to be fighting against, thereby regulating themselves and their causes to the soulless carnival funhouse of outrage and drama building power through our own institutions is incredibly important to building a strong left but that ideal can get hamstrung in electoral hero worship coupled with a bit of nihilism the late michael brooks once said be kind to people be ruthless to systems a credo that hits home for me since i've seen up close the callous way capitalism operates while the poor and working class are being ground to powder we are also being mined for every last cent, part of a poverty industrial complex that operates in plain sight. But many of us can't see it function because its victims are the elderly, people on Medicaid, children in foster care, etc. Quote, states and their human service agencies are partnering with private companies to form a vast poverty industry, turning America's most vulnerable populations into a source of revenue. Billions in federal aid and other funds from impoverished families, abused and neglected children, and disabled and elderly poor as the vulnerable struggle, as advocates strive to assist in their struggle, and as policy experts across the political spectrum debate the best structure for government aid programs, a massive siphoning of the safety net is occurring beyond the scenes. That's from the book The Poverty Industry by Daniel L. Hatcher. The neoliberalism of the poor is happening. Voting rights are being stripped back to the pre-civil rights legislation era, and people are still asking if electoral politics are important. I guess that comes down to the definition, right? Are these debates truly concerned with broadening a discussion on building left cadre, or is it merely catnip for the connoisseur of political outrage? And on that note. Well, all right. It's time. I just want to make an addendum to Michael Brooks' statement. Yes. Be cruel to systems. Be mean to stupid motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> That's my mantra. But uh, thank you guys. On behalf of Deep State Cuba and his five o'clock shadow, that is really hilarious because it looked like you were clean shaven. And now you have stubble on your chin in 45 minutes. I don't know how. I'm actually did. twins that <laughs> shave on alternate days, and when you cut to Pascal, we subbed out. <laughs> Eating your cereal with chopsticks. There's another way to eat cereal. <laughs> we will. The the link should already be up. If you are a patron, if you're not a patron, patreon.com backslash bitterlake presents. 
and we will see you in a few. Get there quick, guys, because, again, we, uh, we have to go. Let's have a long drive. So thank you guys very much, and we are out.